All right. Well, welcome everyone to June. So uh, thank you all for joining us. This is our 11th webinar now. Can't believe uh, we were all just talking. We actually started this back in March. So um, I guess, look, hey, we are all still alive. Hopefully all of your businesses are still not only alive, but successful and, and uh, surviving. So uh, I think the pandemic survival guide uh, hopefully is, is effective. So um, mm -hmm. for those, for those of you that, uh, that, that haven't, haven't joined us before, my name is Ed Earl. I'm coming to you from San Diego and where I run a construction project management company uh, working as an owner's rep for homeowners building custom homes. And I'm also a business coach that works with residential contractors with these two other gentlemen. And I'm excited to announce that we have gone international this week. And so I'm gonna turn it over now to our, our Finland correspondent, Paul. <laughs> this, I, I, I have a summer home in Finland, so I'm here in Finland. Like, news about Finland. There's no COVID, no mask, and no protest. It's just one giant middle class. So, you know, there's something to be said for the Finnish government. And I've been doing this for 35 years, not Finland, but I've been doing this 35 years. My wife's Finnish, that's why I'm here. And so it's beautiful out. You know, it's great. It's like the day, it's always day right now. There's no nighttime to speak of at all. So makes working at night really easy because like now it's whatever it is it's like 904 at night and looks like two in the afternoon <laughs> i'd have to get used to that i'm david Luperger. i'm uh not so international just in boulder colorado former building contractor so also a business coach working with ed and paul and just trying to bring that practical experience to the table and between the three of us Gosh, we talk to a lot of contractors every single week. Back to you, Ed. All right, David. Well, thank you. Yes, we, we talk to about 50 plus residential contractors every week. Um, and over the last three months since this pandemic has started, we've gotten a lot of great feedback from our, our clients, also given a lot of good advice and recommendations. And so this, uh, this webinar that we're doing every other week is our opportunity to share that with all of you. Um, looking at our list of attendees, I see we've got some uh, current coaching clients that, as well as people that, that aren't. Um, and that's the purpose of this webinar is to really share all of this information and, and get it out to everyone. So I started this little tradition of uh, starting our webinars with a little bit of humor. And uh, so I'm gonna share some signs that uh, David actually sent to me. This one's a couple of months back, but I think you could still relate to it. So these are all church signs. So this church says, I had not planned on giving up quite this much for Lent. So uh, that's, uh, that's back in March. I think we can go back and, and laugh at that one. Uh, this one from the Walnut Grove Baptist Church, uh, this too shall pass. It might pass like a kidney stone, but it's gonna pass. There we go. Um, and uh, I, I, I like this one. This is a journey of faith. Jesus rode an ass into Jerusalem. Keep yours at home. So uh, I don't know what part of the country that's in, but I like that one. And then uh, this one, David, I got to think maybe this one might have been in Boulder. Uh, it's the uh, Academy Christian Church prophecy class canceled due to unforeseen <laughs> circumstances, right? I like that. Uh, yeah, we, we make it up yeah. as we go here. Yeah. He just yeah. was in the construction business, right? You gotta remember that, right? Yeah, exactly. He was a carpenter. So, yeah. you're right. <laughs> yep, he was. You bring That's it full true. circle. Yeah. We, yeah. yeah. So, well, uh, this is another thing we always check in on. So this is good news. We have, we have definitely stabilized, and I think we have definitely turned the corner. Uh, this is an, uh, a, a map the NAHB has put out. I still check it every week. They have not updated it since May 7th. Uh, I don't know if we've got any of our clients from, Pencil, from a New York, but I know that they are, re, uh, they are building again in New York. So, um, so that, that red mark should be, uh, should be changed. So, all right, let's move on to our next topic, which uh, continues to be a source of, of uh, evolving information as well as confusion and uh, a certain amount of, of uncertainty, and that is the um, relief aid. And uh, so let, let's, get, let's start with a little uh, questionnaire here. Uh, all of our attendees there, please raise your hand if you have received money in your bank in the last two weeks from the PPP. Our sense is that most all of our clients now have already received it. Let's see, we got one. Doug? 
So Doug it looks Dawson. Like he's gotten his money yeah. from the from the PPP, um, and that's about it. Okay. So my sense is that, like I said, pretty much everyone that's that's applied for the PPP money now has gotten it. Um, um, I, as far as I know, there is still money available. I got an email from my bank recently saying that uh, that they still had access to it. So the big news oh, here, I which we covered, question. yeah. Um, one of my clients said, well, I got funded once. I have more employees now. Can I apply again? I think the answer to that is no. As far as my understanding is that you can only apply once. And um, once you've applied, you can't apply again unless you've got a separate tax ID number. Uh, I don't know if Marcos is on this, but one of our clients, he's got like two or three different businesses with two or three different tax IDs. So if you have separate tax IDs, you can. But if you are, have already applied under the one tax ID, you can't apply again. So, all right. If you recall, for those of you that were on our webinar two weeks ago, the House passed this PPP Forgiveness Act. Well, last week, on uh, Friday, Trump actually signed it into law. So the Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act is now a uh, law. And that is huge because here are the five key points of this PPPFA. The first is that it extends the forgiveness period from eight weeks to 24 weeks. Now, I want to be clear about this. While it extends the forgiveness period from eight weeks to 24 weeks, you, you have to do more than just spend the money over that 24 weeks. You still have to prove that you didn't have a, a, a reduction in your, um, in your employment level, right? So we've talked about FTEs, full-time equivalents. You have to prove that your FTEs at the start and when you finish are, um, are the same. But another thing um, that it did, and I'm gonna jump to point three, is that it allows you now to go, instead of having to re do a good faith effort to rehire your employees by June 30th, which is the end of this month, you now have another extra six months through December 31st. Um, another key point of this provision is it used to have to use 75% of that money on payroll, now you only have to use 60%. But again, now that you have three times as long to use it, you're probably gonna use it all within uh, on, on the payroll. Um, it also allows businesses to um, receive payroll tax deferment, even if they're using the PPP program. So before you couldn't defer your FICA FUTA payments if you were getting the PPP program. Now you can. And if somehow, some way you aren't able to get all of that amount of money forgiven and you have to repay some of it, you now have five years to repay it instead of just the two years. So that's that's huge. So this pretty much will almost guarantee that all almost at most everyone will be able to get uh, their, their full amount of their PPP forgiven. However, as we've covered in previous webinars, you still have to fill out that darn forgiveness application form, which is a PIA, uh, which is my acronym for pain in the ass. And so it's really a pain. And so Paul has found this. I'm hoping that this, this takes fire. It's only 23 pages of instructions, right? Yeah, right, exactly. So the big banks now are calling for a blanket forgiveness of PPP loans under $150,000, which I think is a brilliant idea, especially when you consider these statistics. So only 26% of PPP loan dollars are for people that borrowed $150,000 or less. So you still would have a fair amount of, of supervision, if you will, over three quarters of the money that was given out. But 85% of the PPP loan recipients, probably most everyone on this call, would benefit. So it would be a great benefit to 85% of the borrowers, but for those people that borrowed more than 150,000, which represents three quarters of the money, they would still need to fill it out. So I think it's a great idea. Um, hopefully that will, that will uh, catch fire with some of the legislation and they'll, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll pass that. Okay, so now I want to move on to the EIDL. That's the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. This hasn't gotten much interest lately, but that's because people were focused on the PPP. So let me see a show of hands. How many of you have received approval notification from the EIDL program in the last two weeks? All right, that's what I thought. Okay, now we're seeing the hands go up. So that's exactly what I found as well. I got my first 
um, notification two weeks ago. I have two different tax ID numbers. I applied under both. So um, th that's that's what we've seen. So um, now let me ask you this. Uh, you could keep your, your hands raised. How many of you have applied for the EIDL program since April? I'm assuming we're going to see probably even more hands go up. Uh, I know a lot of people apply back in April. Uh, I had a contractor yesterday contact me and say, Ed, what does this email mean? What is this EIDL thing? I already got my, you know, my 3000 bucks back in April. And I said, well, this now is the loan if you want to apply for the loan. So I see that Mike, our client Mike is on the line. He uh, got his loan documents on Monday and he texted me and said, hey, Ed, uh, do you have a minute to go over these loan documents? And I said, yeah, sure. So I want to go over a, a few things with you about that in a minute. But the first thing I want to cover, which was a couple of people brought up, um, is uh, for those of you that haven't yet applied for the EIDL, they've changed the rules. Just like everything else with this darn aid program, they've changed the rules. And now the EIDL is only available to agricultural businesses. So for those of you that didn't apply for the EIDL before, unfortunately, right now. now what is an agricultural business? Is raising marijuana or having a farm yeah. or? That all count? Well, good, funny you should ask. Right, well, here it is right here. Agricultural businesses include those businesses engaged in the production of food and fiber, ranching and raising of livestock, aquaculture, and other farming and agricultural related industries. So that seems pretty broad to me. So yeah, I think if you've got a pot farm, you can probably apply for the EIDL. So, all right. So for those of you that have gotten a notification, and once you click on your notification, you, you get your quote. In my case, I didn't qualify for the full 150,000. And then you click on this button uh, for your status once you verify your identity and you, you complete your electronic disbursements. And then you get to this point of signing uh, closing documents. So uh, I did that two weeks ago. This week I got this notice which says your SBA loan application has been approved. And you click on view account and it takes you to these loan documents, which are 19 pages long. So uh, it's, they do have it all set up on DocuSign so that you can sign on DocuSign. So it's pretty simple as far as the actual signing process. But I wanna go through with you these provisions because they are fairly onerous, particularly if they get enforced. And the big if here is if they get enforced. So the biggest thing is that for loan amounts greater than $25,000, you are pledging collateral. So if you recall from previous webinars, we were saying, you know, the PPP is definitely unsecured and we think the EIDL is unsecured as well. Well, that's not the case. If it's more than 25,000, the EIDL is secured. And it's secured by this nebulous term of collateral. They are not, as far as I can tell, going to require you to identify your collateral. But the collateral basically includes this list of about 15 different items, which includes things like your inventory, your equipment, your deposit accounts, your credit card receivables, uh, your, basically almost any kind of form of cash that you have, except for real property and your firstborn. So, so is, it, is it simply a, a, a personal loan guarantee? Can we just say it that way, that basically right. you're assigning and whatever they can get access to, it's a personal guarantee. It's personal loan, you don't have to put your business up. This case you put up your, you know, your computer, whatever you have in your business, that all counts. Um, right. And so it's not, it's, would you can say, Ed, that this is some old document they pulled up from 10 years ago that wasn't really relevant to this and they just used it? Yeah. It's actually from, if you look at the bottom, I don't think I have it on these slides, but it's from 2000. So it's literally 20 years old. Yeah, the loan documents are 20 years old. So, so that's why I think we need to take this with a grain of salt, because if you look at this, also look at the requirements related to the collateral. You can't sell or transfer any of the collateral. And um, you also can't, can't uh, take any other liens on any of your collateral. That means that you basically couldn't go out and and take a vehicle lease or do anything else with any of your collateral um, based on this. So um, uh, also uh, another key thing here is it says borrower will use all of the proceeds of this loan 
solely as working capital to alleviate economic injury caused by the disaster. So I know some of our clients have actually talked about using it to go buy some lots uh, to build some spec homes on. And um, so our recommendation is you don't use this money for that. What you could do is use this money to pay for your payroll or pay for your rent or something that's related to your business operation expenses, and then take that money that you had for your operating expenses and redirect that towards your, towards your investments. And uh, it because seems again like, here, it seems like this was written for hurricanes, earthquakes, fires. You yeah, know, it, exactly. It feels right. like yep. when they talk about disaster. They were talking about the old definition of disaster, not a pandemic. Right. And so it's right. It doesn't exactly. apply. Where it was right, exactly, Paul, where there was a definable event, like you had a hurricane, your roof blew off, or you had some specific disaster. In this case, we're still in the middle of it, and we don't know when it's going to end. So, yeah, that's true. A um, few other things that further reinforces that these, these uh, conditions are not going to be enforced. I like this one. Uh, uh, purchase only American-made equipment and products with the proceeds. So... Uh, you know, basically, you know, what, what are you going to buy that's American made? There's not much these days in the world, unfortunately. So um, also, uh, buy, borrower will not use directly or indirectly proceeds of this loan to relocate without the prior written permission of the SBA. Like, really, you're going to have to write to the SBA before you decide to move your business. We had someone write to us this week, say, you know, we're planning to have our son take over the business in two years. Is this going to prevent us from doing that? I just can't believe that they that they're going to do that. Um, Ed, this this is a thirty year loan. Yeah, they're going to have to live with these provisions for thirty right. years. We're all going to be right. dead by. Then, but <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Always the optimist. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is another thing. The books and records. They want certified financials, like, you know, they want a CPA to sign off on these financials, and they want you to submit them within three months of the end of your fiscal year, which is just totally unrealistic. I mean, probably no one on this webinar has certified financials. I've never had certified financials, so it's pretty ridiculous. And then the last uh, crazy thing is, I love this one, certification regarding lobbying. You have to certify that you're not using the money for lobbying. And if any contracts or subcontracts that are over $100,000, you have to say that it's not using it for lobbying. So basically, almost every construction contract that you have, you know, for any new home or anything that's over 100000 you have to include a certification that you're not doing any lobbying. So anyway, I, our recommendation now, at first we were concerned, but as we've seen more of this, I had a conversation with an attorney yesterday that told me, he said, look, uh, this is on the record, but there's... Not right. giving legal we, advice. We are not. We, yes. Thank you, Paul, for that disclaimer. This is not legal advice, <laughs> but off the record, this attorney said, I can't see how the SBA can can enforce that. So, um, so I just want check to go over CPA, for you here again. Check with, your, check with your CPA and attorney and find out if they really think this 20-year-old document has any shot of being enforced by an agency that is way overburdened over the next 30 years. Right. Right. Yeah. So now for some of you, you might go, well, you know what, forget it. I'm just not going to get it. And that was me. Uh, I was thinking that. And then I had a conversation with a financial planner yesterday and I, I asked him the same question we've talked about here on a previous webinar of, you know, how do you plan for the future when you don't have an accurate picture of the future? You know, Paul Bright brings up that great point that, you know, all ability for a good business owner to, to make strategic plans is based on our ability to predict the future. And none of us can right now. And I thought this, this financial planner was really good. He said, the only thing we know, Ed, is cash is king. Cash is king now, cash is king in the future. And whatever you can do to improve your cash position now, I would do it. So I thought that was a really great point. Look, I don't need the EIDL right now for my business, but I don't know what's gonna happen in six months. So I think I'm gonna take it personally. I am gonna take the money. I don't have to make any repayments for, for, for 12 months. I do, however, think that the interest is going to accrue. So even though you don't have to make any loan payments, you are going to be accruing interest over that 12-month period. 
So and, you are paying something for that, but right. yeah. And if you look at the way interest, the way my wife looks at interest, I'm paying off a house. Why do I own houses cash? Because my wife feels this way. I disagree with her, but hey, you know, happy wife, happy life. Uh, yeah. That, that interest will end up being about fifty or sixty thousand dollars over thirty years if you take that long to pay it. Right. Wow. Exactly. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, even if you just, let's say, just keep the number simple, if you have 100,000, if you were approved for 100,000 and you just want to hold on to it, you know, for a year, that's uh, $3,500. So basically $300 a month is what you're going to pay for the convenience of having at your disposal that $100,000. So if you multiply it again, on average, like so 15 years times $3,500 is what? I'm going to calculate it's over 50 grand. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like a house loan. It's like $50,000 or $60,000 yeah. in interest. But then if you right. consider the inflation at 2.5%, and is the interest deductible, Ed? Uh, yes, the interest is deductible. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. And that means that if uh, you're paying on your tax credit at like 2.5%, and one can make the argument that the money's free if inflation is at 2, 2.5%. Two so, and they look at it, right? Right. Exactly. So I'm going to actually do the official math. If you if you borrowed the full amount of 150,000 at 3.75 percent, that's your interest is going to be five thousand six hundred and twenty five dollars for the first year. So that's four hundred and sixty eight dollars a month is what you're paying in interest. So uh, you know, not not insignificant, but to have the capacity of that hundred and fifty thousand, and remember, this isn't a line of credit. So the minute you sign these loan documents, that that money shows up in your checking account. So you have use of that immediately. So, all right. Um, any questions, David, that we should answer at this time? I I'll do a good job of trying to follow up with emails. But is there yeah, anything I, I, that might be? I, I think you remember the original ten thousand dollar grant or one thousand yes. per employee. The question yes. is thoughts on taking a loan amount equal to the grant amount that we received, because that original grant isn't wasn't that was that forgivable the original. Yes. Up to ten thousand dollar grant. Okay. Yes, that is that is forgivable, right? Okay. Um, what I'm not clear about, and I don't know if anyone's gotten this far yet, I know that the PPP forgiveness form asks if you got the EIDL advance money, and there was talk that that money would be taken out of your PPP amount. Um, but my understanding is that that was supposed to be taken out when they calculated the eligible amount that you had for your PPP. And so for some people, like I think Mike, who's on this call, he applied for the, the PPP um, before he applied for the EIDL. So they couldn't take that out of his qualified amount of the PPP. So I'm not sure what happens with that EIDL advance money, if and how they, they forgive it, if they're gonna take that yes, off of the PPP or not. Is Mike C on this call? I can't see the list. Well, I'd love to uh, pull that, but I got in the, in the meantime, uh, Marcos is asking, so literally as soon as we sign the EDL and receive the money, we're paying interest on the full amount. Yes. Exactly right, Marcos. Yep. Yes. So it's not it's not a line of credit. It's not, oh, I'll just take ten thousand now. If they approved you for a hundred thousand, you're getting a hundred thousand in your bank account and you're paying three thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars a year for that hundred thousand dollars. And Mike Concrete is on with us today. Is that who you're asking yeah. about, Paul? Yeah, that's that. No, no, it was uh, it was Mike CA, and I don't see Mike. Mike's not on. Okay. So, um, yeah. All right. Okay. So let's uh, let's move on here. We're we're just about to our ha half an hour mark, but I want to at least cover some some more topic here. Um, so we can talk a little bit more. We're we're getting now. We're turning the corner, right? We're we're in the p pandemic reality check. We're way past the point of us all thinking it's going to go away soon. Uh, this was a um, a uh, report that the NAHB chief economist put out here a couple of weeks ago, predicting a sharp recession to come. Um, and I, I loved his how he pointed this out. He said, "Look, you really have to look at it in terms of two months, two quarters, and two years." 
And his, his point was in two months, no one knows where it's going to be. Probably not much different than it is now. Two quarters, hopefully we'll start to see some turnaround. But realistically, it's probably going to be two years before uh, we really get out of this thing completely. Um, here's some other good news that actually came out uh, this week. Um, uh, May represented the largest monthly increase in construction jobs since the government began tracking employment in 1939. Now, that being said, obviously April saw the biggest downturn, so um, that's how we could have the biggest upturn. But, uh, but still, I mean, it's good news that, that at least things are, are starting to come back. So really that gives us some, some good news and bad news, right? The bad news is your local construction market is gonna decrease as a result of the pandemic. There's just really no way around this at this point. Um, we were talking to Marcos this morning about Los Angeles and how the fact that all production entertainment companies have been shut down for months and, and still are. I mean, there's LA Times came out with a new set of rules that they're requiring for entertainment production companies to start again. And they're like, this is impossible. We can't, you know, we can't film a, a television show or a movie under this. So your local market is probably gonna go down. But the good news is that your construction business is such a small percentage of your total local construction market. So it doesn't take much, even if your local market decreases significantly, if you increase your own market share by just a really small percentage, you can maintain your same sales level. And this is something I showed in detail a few weeks back on our webinar. I'm just going to go over it really quickly. But, you know, if, if your local construction market goes down by 30%, all you have to do is increase your market share by three-tenths of 1% to basically go from 0.6% to 0.9%, and you won't see any drop in your, in your sales level. So... How do you do that? Well, you do it through marketing, right? And it's important for us all to realize that you have to change your marketing perspective. And Paul, you bring up the good story about Nike, right? And uh, you want to tell your, the, the, what, what does Nike do? Is yeah, Nike I, a, a, a shoe yeah, company? Years, I haven't had this many people to do this over 35 years, but some have done it very successfully. They feel I convinced that all successful companies realize they're marketing companies that sell products to fund their marketing. And very few people in the building industry have any idea of, you know, what cost to market, cost of sale. They just answer the phone and do a good job. Um, I think we model's advantage for other people say that you probably should spend 2% of your gross on marketing. So if you're doing, you know, a million, that's what, 20,000, right? 20 grand. Yep. Yep. And if you're doing right. 10 million, that's 200,000 on marketing, right? If you're doing 10 right. million. So... Yeah. Most people don't do that. I think the good news about this is when when this pandemic thing hits, a lot of people get scared and they don't do anything. They just freak out and freeze and you know. So actually the competition dies down because of people that are paranoid of doing anything and they, they're all conserving cash. So it's really good opportunity to get a bigger part of market share because a lot of your competitors are are withdrawing their marketing they're not spending as time on it, money on it one of my friend is is uh, works with us in social media and he says facebook advertising has never been cheaper because a lot of the other people have just bailed on the market um restaurants you know other people that were competing for those facebook dollars have gone away so you get huge bang for your buck in fact he's got one client that we're working with that's been generating what 20 leads a week out of facebook for like yeah mm -hmm. yeah Right. So right. It is it's a really good time to get aggressive on marketing. And yeah. it does cost time and it costs money. But we can help you or have a local person help you. But now is the time to double down on marketing because the competition right. costs and you can have a bigger share of a smaller market if you're going to survive this thing. And what you've done before, you know, doesn't is no longer effective. You know, if you in the past, oh, I just do with word of mouth and that's done me great. The fact is this is a different environment. We've never, even if you've been in business for 30 years and oh, I've never done any advertising, it's all word of mouth. I, I'm, I'm not sure that you've ever encountered anything quite like we've hit. So the point of this kind of build it and they will come is not gonna be relevant anymore. You really need to, to change your marketing perspective. 
for many years, contractors were as a badge of courage. Well, I don't have to market because I'm so good. The world beats the pathway to my door. Well, I said then, right. you know, Nike must be really stupid, right? I mean, and Taco Bell, I mean, right. why are they marketing? They are Coca-Cola's got to be really dumb. So um, right. I would say that that is, it's going to, it's the sort of the key. If you believe that do a good job and they will come and that marketing is a, is a weakness as a contractor. And if you're good, you shouldn't do it. You may not be in business a year from now. So, you know, the first step really in re-examining your marketing approach is start with what you know, right? You know, where do you get your leads from right now? And, and one of the things that we talk about is, you know, don't overlook those. The, the referrals, the architects, the brokers, the people that are giving you business right now, start with them, right? And then expand beyond that. So, um, and expanding beyond that can also mean also expanding your scope of services, right? So maybe if you are just a custom home builder, you might want to expand back into remodeling uh, and, and work in areas that you haven't previously worked in. So, um, and I, I say, you know, successfully across the board that the clients we work with, we work with about 50 contractors between two guys that a truck that do, you know, 500,000 and there's a guy that builds 150 houses a year, everybody in between. Um, the people that have, you know, gotten serious about marketing, they've found results very quickly. And they're all doing incredibly well in this current situation. I mean, their problem is we can't find employees fast enough. And there is, yeah. there's an interesting thing that's happened with this pandemic employees. You would think, hey, you know, everybody's out of work, looking for a job, you know, no problem. We shouldn't be able to find employees. Well, that worked for a while, but then we realized in the, in the lower echelon employee, if you had a job and for example as a lifeguard or a waitress or something um, you may be making more money than you've ever made in your life by staying home so with the 600 i mean if you get if you're making let's say your social say say you're making 800 a week and you get half that's 400 a week and you get your other 600 a week that's a thousand a week for staying home you're basically making 15 2000 a year by staying home it's hard to motivate those people to go out and work. And that may be over in July, but right now on the, the lower paying jobs, we're having a harder time finding people because they don't bother. They're just staying at home collecting unemployment. Yeah. And uh, then the last point on this slide is also to get creative with your marketing budget, right? Find additional resources that you can use. You know, that again, that EIDL loan might be a, a way for you to, to use that for marketing. Uh, I think that's a complete justification that if you were to say, use all of your EIDL on, on marketing, that's absolutely in response to the, to the disaster. So. And then what Paul said earlier, which is, you know, recession is not a time is a time to increase your marketing, not not decreasing it, right? And uh, as Paul said, you know, because your competition is cutting back, a lot of people will cut back on marketing, and so that will make yours yours even more effective. So one of the one all of right the illusions that built one well, quickly here the illusions that builders have is that they feel that once they get the business. They're going to spend the money on marketing and employees, which is totally backwards to the way most businesses run. You spend the money on employees because every employee makes you money. You spend the money on marketing because marketing produces results. So you spend the money on marketing employees before you get the work to get the work. You don't wait for the work to come before you spend the money. And a lot of contractors haven't quite figured that out yet. All right, so give you a little preview. On our, on our next webinar, we're going to talk about four approaches to expand your market share. So four ways that you can expand your market share in a declining market. So, um, so we will go over that on the next one. I'm going to leave you with the same slide that we, we did back, created back in March, and I feel is still as relevant today which is, you know, stay informed. This is a continually changing circumstances, but don't watch the news every night. Um, whether it's in regards to, uh, to the coronavirus or Black Lives Matter, the, the media wants to get people anxious and wants to get people uh, upset. And uh, that's not, not good for a business owner. So stay informed, absolutely, but don't, don't binge watch on the news.
connect with your peers, right? Whether you're a member of Remodelers Advantage or or a Builder 20 group, um, stay connected. Come to these webinars. Also a great way to connect with your with your peers. Um, and be optimistic about the long term. I love the quote from Dr. Wayne Dyer that you know no one knows enough to be a pessimist. So stay optimistic on the on the long term and focus on short term solutions because again that's all that we can control at this point is what can you do next week and what can you do next month because no one knows where we're going to be three months from now or six months from now. So all right, and this too shall pass like uh, just like a kidney stone. I might be curious about Ed. Is it our experience? Yeah. And again, it's a very small group of 50 people that we're working with. May do I don't know four or five hundred million all in. Um, generally, business is awesome. I mean, that's yeah. been our experience. It's it it had a little dip there for a while, but it's totally taken off. And most of our clients are doing really really well, which I can find surprising. So that's what we that's the you know, focus group of 50. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And we are here for you. This is all of our phone numbers and our email addresses. We answer every one of our emails and every one of our phone calls. So uh, please, if you have any questions about any anything that we've covered here today or any issues or challenges that you're having with your business, we are happy to help. So uh, we will be back again in two weeks for our, our next webinar, which will be at the same time, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. And um, please spread the word. We're happy to have, uh, if you, any of you, I know some of you have shared this with your local builders groups or maybe your local NARI group. Um, we're happy to, happy to have uh, shared this information with as many people as possible. So please, uh, please sh uh, share, this, share this if uh, you found these, the, these webinars uh, helpful. So. All right, so thank you all for joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you on June 26th. Right. Take care, Thanks all. Bye, everyone.